I want to welcome you tonight, Wednesday night, midweek Bible study here at Arbor Christian Fellowship. And uh, we're going to take a look at a psalm. And so glad that you're being with us and glad for those here around with me live in the Bible study. Uh, title of my uh, message is A Shelter in Dangerous Times. A Shelter in Dangerous Times. And it's Psalm 46. So let me give you all a moment to find uh, Psalm 46. I hope those of you viewing it at home or in your office maybe or where ever you're, you're viewing in your bedroom and things, uh, we'll have your Bible with you and possibly a sheet of paper or a, or a pen. I, I write notes into my Bible. I underline verses and things. And I've gotten a little bit of flack at times for they say I desecrated the Bible. And, uh, you know, I don't respond to stuff like that, nor do I let it get me down. But uh, it's okay to underline certain Bible verses and things. And, uh, and, and so I, some people use a system of having separate notes and they'll put them in a file. And others will write in between the verses or the spaces. Uh, in their scripture. So we're looking at Psalm 46, a shelter in dangerous times. The very occasion that the psalm was written was possibly a feared invasion. It, it, does that ring a bell today? A, a feared invasion and the start of World War III back in the ancient world. Uh, if the Assyrians moved upon Israel. So hopefully I can uh, seriously put some content and context to this psalm for our situation uh, today. The title is, A Shelter in Dangerous Times. And uh, as I was telling the folks around the table before we began the video, it seemed like watching the news for about the last 8, 9, 10 days, you hear the words, World War Three, World War Three, World War Three, and things. And... Uh, uh, I'm not going to get into political commentary or military strategy or anything. I'm going to teach the Word of God. But I do want to make uh, the point that we're living in, in dangerous times. In fact, uh, starting in the year 2020, it just seemed like something has seemed to have shifted in attitude and in the globe and, and mindsets. And uh, some of it is, is fear. And I've admonished my congregation and some of you viewing in past messages to be careful but not fearful. Of course, that was uh, applied to uh, the virus, the, the pandemic, whether it be a, a big, strong flu or whatever it is, whatever it's called and, and things. Uh, I, had, I had a very strong flu about a month ago or less than a month ago. And I, I put myself in the quarantine for 10 days. I had somebody fill in for me on Wednesday night and on Sunday and always was glad to be back. So uh, it, there's, there's just, we, we, we feel that things have shifted. And uh, if nothing else, the world isn't as safe as, as it was maybe in 2019. <laughs> Though things were stepping up and, and leading up to So let me get to Psalm 46. The the occasion and the history behind this psalm, according to some Bible scholars and teachers, and, and that is that uh, there was a feared invasion that was going to come from the Assyrians, who are out to dominate the world. And as I said earlier, I hate to be redundant, but that does that ring a bell today about an invasion? And uh, even though it's far away from us here in Southern California, in Yuppieville and South Orange County, uh, the war in Ukraine has come home, in a sense, to me personally, because a pastor of mine, a pastor friend of mine, whose church I preached in, in Mariupol, and that's big action going on there, uh, it's like uh, they want to do genocide on the civilian population. The pastor's daughter was killed when Russian tanks fired upon her apartment complex. And this was a big apartment complex, and she was killed in it. And uh, I'm, I'm grieved, and even though the war is so far away, and I've been to Ukraine many times, uh, our church has been praying, and tonight, after the Bible study, we will pray for these friends, and, uh, 
And, and so the pastor sent me a, a, an email about, and asked for prayer. And, uh, and then, so even a war like that so far away and in the news can come home to a lot of us in one sense or another. So let me get to the good stuff, okay? I don't want to start off on such a downer, but uh, uh, we will be praying for the family. And uh, Psalm 46, just 11 verses, it begins with God, and it ends with God in verse 11. The God of Jacob, our stronghold. God is our refuge and strength. That word refuge literally means uh, a shelter. It, it really represents a high, safe shelter, a place of refuge. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. And it seems that uh, we've been living in some time of uh, trouble. I might use the high, heavy, pollutant, theological world word, discombobulation starting with a pandemic and all the yays and nays about it and, and everything, and uh, Satan's attempt to close down and shut down churches permanently, but it didn't happen. It, it, we're here, the other churches. Uh, God is our <coughs> refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change. And uh, would you not agree with me that something has changed upon the earth, uh, something, there's been some kind of a, of, a, of, a, of a shift, and we see here the world's instability, we see the world's instability, and it comes home big time on the five o'clock news and in the papers, and uh, we, we see here, therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea. That's pretty radical, radical change. That's metaphor for everything, just uh, being discombobulated. Though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its seeping pride, the good news, verse 4, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns, when the morning uh, dawns. And so here we see that God is ever present. God is present. We see His presence with us, and it it uses the the, uh, the term uh, that uh, it's a double of of God, uh, because the God Most High uh, will not be moved. He is He is there, and then it goes on, verse six: the nations made an uproar, the kingdoms tottered. Kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice, and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. And that word stronghold is the word misgab in Hebrew, which literally means a high, safe place. Uh, a high, safe uh, place. A area of guard where you can see. It's, it's a very high overlook where you can see what's going on. You can see the enemy. You could prepare that you're in a place of safety. Verse 8, come behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations on the earth. In other words, he's going to take care of these enemies of God. And uh, he will make wars to cease to the end of the earth. Uh, th there's going to be a final war. The Bible calls it the Armageddon, the Battle of Armageddon. And uh, the location is the plain of Megiddo or the little hills of Megiddo, and then the word Har uh, is is the word for a mountain or hill. So you have Har Megiddo, the hills of Megiddo, Ar Megiddo, and so that's where the final battle is going to be. It's going to happen after all the Christians are raptured out of this planet, and only the unsaved and lost people are left and remain. It'll be a seven-year period of tribulation. Uh, we looked at this uh, Sunday in our worship service. Hopefully you saw and uh, God touched you and spoke to your heart regarding that. But uh, Jesus Christ is going to return at the end of the Battle of Armageddon before the world destroys itself. 
Now, whether nukes are involved, the, devil, the Bible doesn't say specifically, but don't let silence, don't let silence rule something out. I mean, usually in a war like this, you use the worst weapons you could ever have. With Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, it was rocks and clubs. And then, you know, later on, got more sophisticated weaponry with spears and knives and, and chariots. And then later on, you know, the Cossacks and the horse armies and the cavalry. And then, of course, artillery came. And each war, it seems, the weaponry gets to be more and more dangerous. And uh, we live uh, in a nuclear age. And by the way, there, there has been, I don't know whether to call it a nuclear war, but we do know that World War II ended with the exploding of the atomic bomb over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the enemy said, that's enough. And that was a, a pretty puny, I, I know that doesn't make sense, <laughs> an atomic bomb's an atomic bomb, but compared to the weaponry and the hydrogen bomb and all this talk, uh, that was a pretty low-grade nuclear nuclear uh, a weapon. And we're hearing today in the news, you know, perhaps they're, they're going to launch some limited nuclear warfare and this and that and, and whatnot. Uh, we do need a shelter. We do need a shelter in this dangerous times. So uh, verse 10 and 11 is the great news. Cease striving and know that I am God. We'll touch upon that, because uh, that's so valuable. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Now, we hearing in the politics, cutbacks in our weaponry, and cutbacks and scaling back military this, and this and that, and uh, uh, we do need to have uh, uh, our weapons as a, you know, protectoring thing for us and as a deterrent as a deterrent but God is our stronghold God is our greatest protector of all so we want to look at this Psalm 46 now once again Psalms is the book that teaches us how to worship God it is a book that is vertical it takes us from here in the world our situation our strength Circumstance, good, bad, or ugly, into the presence of God and, and God with us. In fact, uh, what's interesting, and you've heard me say this uh, at least a thousand times, uh, that if you open your Bible to the very center, that you should open it to the Psalms. Unless you have a big Bible dictionary or a concordance or a big, <laughs> humongous, it, exhaustive uh, index concordance in the back. Another thing, too, not only do we need to realize that uh, the book of Psalms is in the center or the heartbeat of the Bible, it's the heart of the Bible, is that it is categorized in the Old Testament writings uh, as what is known as wisdom literature. Wisdom literature. It's the Hebrew word hokama, which literally means uh, practical ways of living, teaching us practical uh, ways of of living in this world. Uh, there's five wisdom books in the Old Testament, and they're all in the center of the Bible. There's Job that teaches us how to suffer. There's Psalms that teaches us how to get along with God. It's vertical. The next book is Proverbs, which is horizontal. It teaches us how to get along with one another. Uh, with one another. And then there's Ecclesiastes, uh, and then Song of Solomon. And uh, the Song of Solomon talks about the beauty of love in a, in a marriage, a man and a, and a woman. By the way, man and a woman, and that hasn't changed no matter what they're teaching our first graders in public school. Man and a woman. A man and a woman. Uh, so uh, those, these wisdom uh, books are in the center of the Bible. Wisdom. And that's where we get our wisdom for living. So, let me focus on God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. We need to realize this. We need to realign our life in trusting God. We need to rely 
on God. We need to release his truth into our lives and in the world and then relay God's truth to others. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm doing this study is the, the, the times that we live in right now is always a good opportunity to talk about, uh, about Christ. Uh, there are people that are stressed out or people that are struggling uh, with situation and circumstance. Some are, are in fear. And uh, people, uh, at least what I've experienced in the last week and a half, uh, talking to people at Starbucks, and some of them have even come up to me. They know I'm a pastor and ask questions about the end of the world and about you know this and that and what does the Bible say about the Russian invasion and and, and everything, and uh, I tell them, well, I'm not a, a Bible uh, expert in prophecy. I'm a student of it. I, I, I'm a student of it, and I forgot that I've read the book of Revelation at least 150 times. The other week I said 80 times, 70 times, but I forgot that I read it another one of these times. And I keep journals and things, and, and uh, so it opens the door. It, it, opens the, it opens the door, and it opens the door for me to say, that this week in current events, in geopolitics, there is an emerging alliance of Russia, China, and Iran. Russia, China, and Iran. And the Bible says, Ezekiel 37, 38, 39, and then a little chunk of the book of Revelation, that in the end time, uh, possibly related to the battle of Armageddon, or a war <coughs> or skirmish before Armageddon, that there'll be a an alliance against the people of God, of Russia, China, and Iran. Yes, Iran is in the Bible. Uh, it's called Persia. It's called Persia. And if you look at Ezekiel 37, 38, 39, you'll see the word Persia. That's modern day Iran. And uh, I, I kind of have a feeling that the Russians would love to wipe us out. I, I kind of have a feeling that China wants to be the top banana in the world, and they think they have the means. Uh, how does China focus in on Bible prophecy? Bible prophecy in the end times said that there will be a 200 million man army from the east that will bully and attack and be part of, the, of a big world war. Whether that's World War Three, or World War Four, World War Five, or the Battle of Armageddon, doesn't specifically say, but it says that that that, and there's only one nation in the world that can man a 200 million man army, and they they've got that when you count their reserves and then the young boys that they put in to combat 200 million. So there'll be an alliance of Russia, China. And Iran, uh, as I've always maintained, you could put a newspaper in one hand and the Bible in another hand, and the prophecies in the Bible can coincide with some of the geopolitics uh, that's involved uh, there. So, in all of this, I'm positing that God is our shelter and refuge in dangerous times. This is something we need to realize. We need to know, and we need to understand and as a result of that therefore we will not fear though the earth should change and it seems in the last year especially the last couple of months it seemed like something on earth has has changed uh, though the earth should change uh, things geopolitically they, they have uh, this uh, change in that it totters it's off balance, and we're seeing some things uh, that are basically very, very off balance. But no matter what, realize that God is in control. God is in control. Uh, the earth totters and, and shakes. And uh, here we see three things. First of all, we see the world's instability the world's instability, second, our inability, our inability, we can't seem to fix uh, this thing with the uh, evil and wickedness in the human heart, and especially those that deny God, 
Russia at one time claimed to be a total, pure, atheistic nation. But they couldn't keep the Russian Orthodox Church down. They met underground, they prayed. I was involved in the 70s uh, in Bible courier work. Some people call it Bible smuggling, but that's kind of what we were doing, taking into the Soviet world. Russian, Bulgarian, Hungarian, Romanian. We went through the Berlin, Berlin Wall into East Germany and East Berlin with German Bibles and things to, uh, to give at drop-off points for pastors that would take them and distribute them into the various uh, uh, churches. So no, Russia uh, for years through the communist regime of 70 years uh, claimed to be an atheist nation. All the founders of communism, Marx and Engels, Lenin, Stalin. Stalin, uh, the butcher that he was, was a seminary dropout. He at one time wanted to go into the Russian Orthodox ministry but he dropped out and became a revolutionary, he became an, an atheist. Uh, his replacement, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, he stood up at the United Nations and wagged his finger and said that we will destroy America. The words he actually said is, we will bury you. We will bury you. Nikita Khrushchev got deposed, according to Billy Graham. And some of the people told me when I was doing some crusades with Billy Graham. Graham was in the know, and Graham had contacts in Russia, and that Nikita Khrushchev, in his later years, even as a cruel, wicked dictator, this could be a story right out of the Old Testament, I mean, right out of Kings and Chronicles, uh, became a believer, accepted Jesus Christ. And uh, he got deposed. He got deposed by the common term. And mercifully, they did not execute him, but put him out to pasture and put him out to exile. So you see, there's no dictator, no Stalin, no Khrushchev, no Putin who is stronger than God. They're nothing compared uh, to God. So we see here... Uh, Though the world should change, though the earth should change, though things change radically in geopolitics. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm going to go off the rails here for a moment. It just seems to me that there is a perceived weakness now in the, in the United States. And I'm not saying go to war against Russia. That's the last thing we want. We don't, we don't want 100,000 Russians or Americans or Europeans dead in a war, but some way, somehow, America has seemed to lost some resolve. I'm not going to name names, I don't think I even have to, but notice here in verse 36, that we will not fear, though the earth should change, and we've, we've seen, we've seen a shift in the circumstances, we've seen a shift in what they call geopolitics. But God's promise and God's covenant promise never changes. Nobody can, can change that. We, we see the world's instability. Then we see our inability. Oh, the UN can talk and talk and talk. But where was the UN during the Vietnam War? Where was the UN in all the wars that our young men and women and boys and girls have, have gone to the, the UN? Talk, talk, and, and talk. We see the world's instability and our inability, but then we see God's ability. God speaks. God is in control. And it says here that uh, God's going to take control and, and, and change things. We see that this is something we need to realize. Not only do we need to realize God's power and God's control, and by the way, God's on top of it. And what happened in the Ukraine and the invasion did not surprise God. Did not surprise God. And uh, by the way, we as Southern Baptists in Arbor is a Southern Baptist Convention Church. Uh, Southern Baptists have a seminary that we fund uh, in Lvov. It's the Ukrainian Baptist uh, Seminary and Hereshlav Push 
is the president, and we've been praying for him. And uh, put put that down. Put Harishlov, Harishlov, the president of the Ukrainian Baptist Seminary. That's one of our seminaries that we started as a denomination, and we support. So in my church, when people put money in the offering plate, we give a percentage of the offering. Uh, you know to go into foreign world missions, and part of it goes to support this seminary. And the last uh, communique I received from Harshloff was that they're hosting the entire seminary grounds and building. This is Tent City, and the buildings are holding refugees that have escaped from Kiev, or Kiev, as they say, and from other parts of, uh, of, the, of Ukraine, and those that did not choose to go into Hungary or Czechoslovakia or into Poland. Poland has absorbed a tremendous, a tremendous amount of, of refugees. Uh, notice uh, God is our refuge. And when we're a refugee, uh, God is there. He is our strength. Therefore, we will not fear. We see the world's instability, our inability, but we see God's ability. When the world gets deplorable, as what we're seeing with what the Russians and Putin is doing in the Ukraine, uh, when the world is deplorable, God is still dependable. God has the final word. God has the final say-so. So not only do we need to realize, number one, second, number two, we need to realign. We're, we need to realign our thought and thinking and patterns to the truths of God. Through the, the words of God, through worshiping God vertically in the book of Psalms and getting along with our neighbors and people at the workplace and where, as it says in the book of Proverbs. As I hinted earlier, Psalms and Proverbs is known as a wisdom category. Now in the Old Testament, the first five books is called the book of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's, it's called the, the books of the law. After that comes the historical, the, the historical books. Uh, Joshua, Judges, and then the Chronicles and the Kings, and 1st, 2nd Samuel. And it's all about the history of the kings. It's a chronicle. By the way, the, the newspaper in the San Francisco area where I grew up was the San Francisco Chronicle, the, the Chronicle, and the book of Chronicles, uh, Chronicles, the, the kingdom and the kings. And these are all pictures and metaphors pointing towards the true King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, the ultimate, the true uh, king. Uh, the majority of the, the kings in uh, Israel, both in the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, were bad kings and wicked kings, and their badness is brought out. They, they were all bad, except one. Uh, that king, too, had sinned and fell short of the glory of God, but it's not mentioned in the Bible. And that's who we call Good King Hezekiah. That's why they call him Good King Hezekiah. He was a man of prayer. In fact, he was forced on his knees to pray when invaders were, were coming. A, a good, good king. And we need to continue to pray for our nation that we have good leadership. I'm not a big fan of our Congress. You know, I'm just not. I'm, I'm sorry. I still vote. And unfortunately, sometimes I have to hold my nose when I vote. Sometimes I feel like I'm voting for the lesser of the two evils. I had a, when I was pastoring up in Northern California, a city outside of Sacramento, I got to be friends with a, a young man uh, that was on the school board. He was on the school board, and uh, he wanted to run for state assembly, and he had political ambitions. So he showed up in my church, attended my church, though never joined, and uh, we met for coffee and this and that, and he told me he's going to run. He's going to run for office. And I said, what, city council or, you know, board of supervisors? No, I'm going to run for state assembly. And I said, uh, well, do you have any backing? Do you have an infrastructure? Uh, are you able to raise funds and raise money? And he said, well, he gave me the price it costs for each political office of what you'd have to raise and things. And uh, he asked me if I would be willing to be his aide 
and uh, help him when he goes and does some campaign and sometimes open in prayer and other times just just be uh, actually told me just that it's to make me look important if I go to these places by myself to speak I, I don't look at if I'm there with a, another person especially somebody like you uh, it makes me look more important and I said I'll help you when I can I'll help you on some days off and we'll do what we can and he ran for state assembly Republican and he won he, he won and I remember the victory celebration I met governor I met state senators I met US senators uh, our state congress people and all, I met them I'm rubbing shoulder I'm sitting at table with them you know and uh, they're drinking alcohol and I'm drinking lemonade and stuff and we're chatting and we're talking and you know I walk away and go wow it's the governor of the state uh, I was not impressed okay <laughs> I'm telling you hey they're human just like you and I have hang-ups and problems and, 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 and troubles and, and things. So my man uh, decided to run for Congress. And I was not available to help. I, I just, my church had gotten way bigger and, and things. And I just said, I, I'll vote for you, uh, you know, and this and that. And, and I just, my first allegiance is to Jesus Christ. Well, he won. He became congressman. And he had me come and visit him uh, for celebrate in his office in Washington, D.C., introduced me here and there to all these people. And then he says, uh, he, come on in privately. I want to talk to you privately. And I said, okay. He said, uh, I'd like you to become my professional administrative aide and admin chief. And what this means is you work for me for four, five, six, seven, eight years. Then when I run for U.S. Senate, and when I'm going to juice you in to be a U.S. congressman. And I said, well, I, I appreciate the sentiment, but I want, to, I want to tell you, congressman, I'm not going to tell you the name because I don't know who's watching or if even he's watching. Uh, I says, I, I already have a higher calling. I'm not going to step down to be president, vice president, governor, senator, or congressman. I have a higher calling, and that's to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. That kind of stunned him a little bit, but thankfully he respected that. So it was good. I mean, it, it, it was good. I don't know. I, I might have destroyed my life if I'd have taken that situation and gotten away and different priority and, and things. Uh, we need to hear the one trumpet call and uh, the one voice of God. Not, the, not all the many, many, many voices. Yeah, we hear them and they're around, but not follow them or kowtow uh, uh, to them. So we need to realize that there is a shelter in dangerous times, and this applies to right now. Unsettling things in the news, the threat of nukes. If uh, Europe or America or somebody declares a no-fly zone, we're going to get nuked and World War III is going to begin. My heart tells me that's a bluff. I, I don't know. I, you know. Maybe it's a good thing that I'm not a political or military advisor it's a good thing that I'm a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ because that is something that I continually am learning how to do better and better and, and better. But we need to realize God is our refuge and strength. We need to realign our thinking, and then we need to rely on Him. We need to rely, our reliance is on Him. And this is what uh, this verse is, is all about. Uh, look at verse 10. See striking and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And what, what is so beautiful here, it says, be still. Be still and know that, that I am a God. Literally, uh, this means take your hands off of it and let me handle it. Uh, just a, an understandable way of this high theological concept. Uh, See striving and know that I am God. It literally means take your hands off of it. Relax. You have my protection. By the way, God says, I can handle it a lot better than you can. Okay, That's something I've learned in over 50 years of ministry, 50 years of loving church members, 50 years of uh, teaching and, and preaching. Um, See striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nation. In other words, we are on the winning side. We are on the winning side. Circumstances may change. Governments may topple. 
Putin may be assassinated tomorrow, or he may live a hundred years, or be deposed and put out to pasture in some little village in Siberia, and maybe let him live. But God never changes. God is never removed from his throne. God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And even though there are those in the world that are deplorable, God is always dependable. Putin, deplorable. Jesus Christ, dependable. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. God says, I, I change not. So we realize, we realign, and then we rely on God, and then we release. We, we release His presence. We release His presence uh, around us. And that, that, that's where, in the end, we relay God's truth. We minister to other people. Let them see our confidence in, in, in God. He is our stronghold. We win in the end. We win in the end. And notice it says in verse 46, uh, chapter 46, verse 2 at the end, though the earth should change, literally it slips, shakes, and totters. I remember one of the first rock and roll songs I ever remember uh, was a song called Shake, Rattle, and Roll. <laughs> Shake, <laughs> Rattle, and Roll. And you know what? That's kind of happening uh, to our culture and to uh, our society and then the world, the global thing. And we live in a world today of instantaneous news. Something happens 8,000 miles away. It's in our living room within minutes. And, you know, it wasn't that way. You know, in World War II... It took days sometimes for the news of a victory uh, to come or the full ramification of a thing. So we praise God. So let me wrap this up with uh, not only do we realize, realign, rely, release, we relay God's presence, God's protection, and God's provision. So God bless you tonight. I, I, I hope that uh, this uh, scripture passage uh, blessed you. and. Take into light and maybe memorize 46.10, verse 10. Cease striving. Be still and know that I am God. I, 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 take your hands off is what this means. Let go and let God. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this study. We thank you for the truth of your word. I pray that you bless everybody. At the sound of my voice, whether here around the table or at home or in their office or uh, in, in the, the, our viewing and looking into your word. Give us a hunger and an appetite for your word in this song. We thank you for the heartbeat of the Bible, the Psalms, how to live with you vertically, how you love us, how you bless us, and how we must rest and relax in you, rely in you, and then release and relay your life, in essence, in our life to those around us. Father, I pray for America. I pray that you will lead and guide, that the churches will stand and be strong. I pray for Ukraine. I pray for the churches uh, there and the leaders and the believers. I just pray, Lord God, that your will be done. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen.